Happy Holy Week, guys. What a blessing to be with y'all. Why do we call Good Friday good? I mean, think about this. This is the worst thing that could have ever happened. Deicide. The murdering of God. Good? And yet, in the plan of salvation, this is the best thing that ever happened. So without Good Friday, there's no Easter Sunday. And you know, there's not only a, a, a story about the love of the Father for us in this, but there's a pattern for our lives. So often it's the most painful things that we live through that bring about the greatest good in our lives, uh, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And I'm so excited about our guest today who's going to share her journey uh, through pain, through the loss of, of her husband, uh, to uh, starting Camp Bow Wow, being one of the lead entrepreneurial women in, in the history of the United States, and running for governor of Colorado. Really blessed to have Heidi Ganahl with us tonight. Thanks for being with us, guys. Heidi, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, Chris, thank you for having me. I read your book. It's fantastic. Th I did not pay her to say that. <laughs> no, I got to tell you, because I look up to you and I love your work. Like, I really admire uh, what you've done. And I, when I, I met you at this gala at Lord's mm -hmm. School, right? I'm like, hey, I wrote this book. She's like, I'm reading it. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, you said, I'm reading it before I go to bed at night. So I'm thinking, okay, so it'll put you to sleep at night. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's the only quiet time I get during the day. Oh, cool. And it actually reminds me to fall asleep knowing that Every day brings joy and calm and connectedness, mm. my three words. And uh, no, it really resonated with me. Praise God. Thank you. Thank of you. Yeah, thank God. Um, and, and I tell you, when you're doing something like running for governor, you need a lot of joy to be strength for you because I'm sure you get attacked and beat down plenty. Well, we were just talking about the, the errors of Twitter. And yeah. it could be a perfectly joyful day until you open your app and you're like, Ugh, okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and there's a whole, I'll tell you what, there's a whole section here on controlling social media and I don't yes. practice what I preach. So thanks for bringing that up as like a conviction to me because it's kryptonite for me like it is for you, right? And like God's like, hey, lift your heart up to things above. And I'm like, okay, Lord. <laughs> But that jerk right there, I wanna, I wish he, he's going to ruin my night. Anyway, um, uh, guys. He needs prayer. Big prayer. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way to take that, right? Uh, I want you to feel free to break into our conversation at any point. Text 720-650-0100 with your questions. So, uh, the, the cross and resurrection. I mean, it's a perfect mm -hmm. week to have you on because of that theme of life, mm -hmm. which is not just a lesson about redemption, but it's a pattern for, for every part of our lives, that, that painful things lead to beautiful things. Um, tell us your story and, um, and why today is a really special day to share it. My mind was blown when you, when you told me. Thanks. Um, yeah. So yeah, sh share, share the story of, of your journey through, through pain to uh, the, the blessings that you know, God's used you and your gifts have, have made you into for the world. Well, and that's my story of my faith. And coming to my faith mm -hmm. was going through some really rough stuff. I mean, I was raised I was blessed to be born into a wonderful family with parents who loved me, adored me. My, we were talking about my grandmother, yeah. my grandparents, and just so, such a great childhood. And grew in up Colorado, to, grew up in Colorado. Well, I started in Southern Cal in, yeah. in Costa Mesa, and then my parents moved us to Monument, Colorado when I was 12. My dad was a reserve police officer out in Orange County, didn't like what he was seeing and wanted a simpler life for us. Yeah. So we go to Monument, we're 3,000 people back in 78. Yeah, it was a there. simpler life in the oh, 70s my goodness. in Colorado. Yeah, I think I cried yeah. for a few months. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> and I wore my pink checkerboard vans to the first day of school, and the kids were like, who are you? What are you doing? I'm like, oh, you'll learn. <laughs> She's not from around here. <laughs> She's not from around here. But I grew to love Colorado, and the yeah. simplicity of Monument was amazing. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And something that helped me along the way was the community that Monument provided, the mm -hmm. people the history. Mm -hmm. And as I went through the tribulations of my life, they were always there for me. They still are. And that's Thank where God. I launched my campaign. How beautiful. Yeah. So, so Heidi, what happened? Tell, tell us about Bayan, which the name is like buying you a beer, right? Yeah. Okay, so, um, it means strength and energy. And he was filled with strength and energy. Um, my first husband and I met um, in downtown Denver at a dance club. Um, and I was with a friend. She met his best friend. And we both ended up getting married, which was kind of cool. Mm. And we'd been married a couple years. Bayan was very entrepreneurial. 
In fact, one of our favorite things to do was to go to Hofbra House. We lived in Arvada in Stanley Lake and mm. get a split a steak and a salad and write up business ideas on the back of restaurant napkins. That's awesome. And about six months, we'd been married for a couple of years, and actually the thing that's special about today is it's, it would be our 30th anniversary today, mm -hmm. our wedding anniversary. I mean, that's, uh, that's really moving. It was pretty, pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, um, he, he was such a great spirit. He had just a light in him. He's one of those people that you meet, and he's always mm -hmm. smiling, and so such great energy, mm -hmm. and his friends that he surrounded him with back then are still good friends of mine and still support me. But fast forward a couple of years after we'd been married and he was just finishing up college at CU Denver. I'd finished up a little bit before because I was a couple of years older than him. Yeah. And um, his 25th birthday was coming up. And our family um, knew another family that grew up in Monument, we grew up in Monument with. And the dad was a United Airlines pilot. And my dad had run into him, his name was Cliff. And he offered to take my dad up in an old 43 Stearman that he was doing air shows with on the side. Mm. And my dad's a super adventurous guy, and so was Bayan. And so my dad's like, let's take Bayan up for a surprise for his birthday, too. And we all thought it was a wonderful idea. We kept it a secret. And they surprised him, took him down to Meadow Lake Airport. And they did all the stunts and went to do a flyby over my folks. And the plane crashed into the ground and killed both Bayan and Cliff mm. and my life changed dramatically at that point. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So that, that um, wow, I just can't believe it's 30th anniversary. That's a, I mean, it's amazing to, to hear the story and share the, the moment with you. Well, and um, first coming in and you saying, hey, this is a really important week. This yeah. is, it's all about the resurrection and, our, and going through trials and tribulations and good coming out of it, right? Yeah. And that's my life story. I mean, so much good has come from, I mean, Losing Bayon was one of the, it was the worst thing that's ever happened to right. me and our family. But um, the love and the outpouring was mm. insane, incredible. Mm. What what was the the darkness that thrust you into? I mean, what um, what was the aftermath of that kind of tragedy? Mm. Uh, it was really bad. Yeah, it was a really dark time for mm. myself, my family, his family, and uh, mostly we just missed him. We missed him so much. And his light, his spirit, mm. and I mean, we all really had a tough time with our. Or I shouldn't speak for everybody, but many of us had a tough time with our faith and wondering oh, yeah. why this would happen to someone who was such a great person. Uh, that I mean, that's the 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 only answer from God is Good Friday, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, here's the worst thing that ever happened, and I'm with you in it. Yes. Right. There's no darkness you're going to go to that I'm not there to, and and I, I wish there was like a more straightforward like. Well, okay, I don't really get the logic of that answer, but I can't look at God and say, hey, you don't know what this is like, right? right? He's just there, just like a community was there. Um, I love how uh, the, the thing that led to, to your, um, I don't know, the, the big career you had <laughs> is tied in to, to, to some beautiful presences, I think, that God sent in your life to help drag you out of the deep darkness. Yes. Um, how did dogs help <laughs> in your lowest moments? Oh, I think they help a lot of people through their lowest moments. <laughs> I think moments. they do. Um, yeah. Mick and Winnie were our rescue dogs, and they were awesome. They were just mm. beautiful creatures. And they would sit at the end of the bed like, hey, get up. We got to play ball. Like, you got to keep living. Mm. And at the same time, I decided to volunteer to be a puppy raiser with Canine Companions. Wow. And add a third dog to the mix. And... Out of the blue, um, they called me and said, hey, we got a puppy sooner than we thought. Um, her name's Ori, and she was born on May 15th, which is actually the day after the crash. Wow. And I wasn't supposed to get a puppy for like six months. Wow. So they hand me this little fur ball, this little golden retriever puppy that I have to take everywhere with me. That's part of training a yeah. service dog. Well, what happens when you take a, a little fluff ball with you to the grocery store, or to the airport? People flock you. to, to yeah, you know, yeah, They yeah. want to talk to you. And it made me come out of my shell and start mm. talking to people again and engaging again. So Ori ended up flunking out of the service dog program. <laughs> but I like Poor to Ori. say she was my service dog. <laughs> That's awesome. She was my angel. And so Mick and Winnie and Ori got me going again. And, and my little brother is the one who said to me a few years later, you've lost your way. Like, you've lost your mojo. <laughs> Let's see if we can't take out one of those restaurant napkins and see if we can't get something going. 
Mm. And he said, which one has your heart? I was like, well, Camp Batwell, the idea for the doggy daycare. Mm. And so about six years after the crash, we, we started the first Camp Bow Wow in 2000 in an old VFW hall just south of downtown Denver. That is so cool. And Bayern was right there along the whole way. Like the whole time yeah. I grew the company, I, it was fraught with disaster at so many moments. Yeah, yeah. And I just had faith and knew it was the right thing to do and knew I had God and Bayern behind me to do this. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, I just love the connection there. I, lo I love seeing the connection, the story arc here. Uh, again, not that God makes bad things happen to bring good things about, but he lets bad things. It was part of the human experience. And it's precisely in those moments, you know, like mm -hmm. here's a, a, pa a passion for, I mean, the love for dogs. Um, <laughs> The chaos, the chaos of being an entrepreneur, man. Uh, so it seemed like a disaster oh. many times. T tell oh us a story gosh. about what, uh, I, and I'm sitting here with one of the, the, the greatest entrepreneurial women in, in the history of the United States. So, uh, I mean, it's truly, right? I mean, that's, it's no small thing you did with Camp Bow Wow. Thank you. Uh, tell us the story of how that came about, how, um, how it came from chaos to a, a, you know, a $100 million company. Uh, <laughs> Give us the summary. Well, I mean, it started out a little rough in that old VFW hall. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, we'd go to the, I'd take um, Tori, my little girl, with me to the dog park or to wash park because there wasn't anything, uh, there weren't dog parks back then. And we'd hand out, we'd have a bucket of milk bones and hand out a free day at Camp Bow Wow flyer with a milk bone. And people wow. would be like, oh, that's cool. Well, the veterinarians thought we were nuts. I mean, they were like, you can't put a bunch of dogs in a room together and have them not hurt yeah, each other or yeah. hurt you. But my, it does seem counterintuitive. I know. Like I've dropped my dogs off at a camp battle. I'm thinking, is, is it going to get eaten? <laughs> no. But they, no. they tend to get along better than humans, I think, when they're just thrown together for a few days. Anyway, go well, ahead. Well, they're sorry. pack animals, and they figure out their pecking order real quick. Yeah. And so once they have their pecking order, it's pretty chill. Yeah. But my brother had this great idea to put a webcam up on a post that would take a picture every 60 seconds and post to the Internet. I mean, brilliant. Yeah, it took off. I mean, that's that's the... I'd say that's probably one of the biggest competitive edges that yeah. that, that made Camp Bellow fly. It, it was. And back then, video streaming was not like today. It would yeah. literally be a picture posted of this fur, mm. and you couldn't really tell what it was. But the other thing that we got really good at once we started to franchise, which was a couple of years later, was um, zoning, planning commission, getting approval to get these places open. And so I did zoning meetings across the country trying to convince people that the waste, the drainage, the noise wasn't going to be an issue or disrupt the businesses around the Camp Bow Wow. Mm. And so that, that was our other competitive edge. But really just helping people build a company, a business around their passion, what a gift that was to me. And at the same time, we built the Bow Wow Buddies Foundation, which helped foster dogs, rescue dogs, while they were looking for a home at the Camp Bow Wows, and we ended up finding wow. homes for over 10,000 dogs over the 10 years. Wow, that's incredible. It was that awesome. It feels really good. That's amazing. Uh, Heidi, there, there's gifts an entrepreneur has like you, that makes you a visionary, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, And I, I'm kind of this way with, with my life's work where like my safe space and my sweet spot is you know, 20 to 30,000 foot. You know? <laughs> but then when you're getting to the weeds, you're, like, you're forced to talk about zoning and stuff like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> How does that not crush the spirit of a person whose <laughs> who's sweet spot is 30,000 feet? Well, I've learned over the years, unelected bureaucrats can crush your spirit pretty quickly. It's part of why I'm running for office. Yeah, and thank you for running, by the way. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> right? um, you know, it's, it's the process, right? It's being able to see it go through it to fruition mm. and see those dogs come in the doors and how happy they are and how happy the mm. entrepreneurs are that get to build a business around okay. something they love. That makes it all worthwhile. Okay, so it's staying in that, that gut uh, sense of like, what's driving me? Yeah. Did you have to uh, like overtly remind yourself of that frequently oh, as yeah. you're dealing with zoning commissions and stuff? As I'd sit for hours waiting to be called up to speak for 30 seconds about how I was going to keep the dogs from barking too loud. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fascinating. Wow. wow. Okay, this question just came in. What advice do you have for young entrepreneurs? And, uh, you know, and maybe another way to, to ask that question too would be, I mean, what, I mean you've studied entrepreneurs, yeah. right? You founded multiple companies, She Factor, which mm -hmm. is so cool, uh, Fight Back, right? Mm -hmm. You connect entrepreneurial people with folks trying to, who are trying to help young people to find yep. solutions to their problems. Um, so you've seen, you've seen factors that, that set people up for success mm -hmm. and, and set them apart as entrepreneurs who actually drive things through to completion. What, what are those factors? What, what would you tell a young entrepreneur with some dreams who's, I'm up here in 30,000 feet, I want to make something happen. 
You have to so believe in your idea Mm. that there is not one ounce of doubt that you're going to make it happen. Like you have to have so much passion for whatever problem you're trying to solve because at the end of the day, starting a business or being an entrepreneur is just about solving a problem for a customer Mm. or for someone. And then you've got to have grit. You've got to have incredible grit. And, you know, grit is something you can develop, but a lot of entrepreneurs are born with that. Like we were talking Mm. about Elon Musk earlier, and I remember him talking about the decision he had to make to support either SpaceX or Tesla. Like there was this, mm-hmm. this divide happening and he knew it was a huge risk to not let either of his babies go down. And so mm. he went all in on both and everybody told him not to do that. And it worked, mm. thank God it worked. He's an incredible mm. success. But um, I had many of those junctures along the way where it was like, um, it's either going all down or it's gonna be a huge success. It's gonna be a big roll of the dice mm. and you've gotta make the right decision. And that is all about gut instinct and knowing what your vision is for the brand and what your vision is for the people that oh. you're leading. And being willing to keep suffering mm-hmm. <laughs> because you believe in it so yes. dang much. There's a, there's, a, there's a high pain threshold, That's I right. think, with people who actually succeed at being an entrepreneur and especially running for governor. Talk about a high pain threshold. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Right? You know, thank the good Lord above that he did give me grit and um, a tough, skin, thick skin. Yeah. Um, and I've been through so much that, you know, a lot of the hits that normally bother people when you're running for office don't bother me as much. About 18 months ago or 19 months now, I went through a really scary time. I got diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I had no idea. Yeah. It, it wasn't cancer, but it was really scary. I was having headaches and I had to have brain surgery. Oh my gosh. Yes, and um, we have amazing doctors here in Colorado. Actually, at CU Anschutz, my doctor, oh, yeah. Dr. Lilla High. But I, I was faced with you know my own mortality and mm. leaving my children behind. That's the hardest part oh, yeah. about facing it. And so I had thought about running for office, and, and it became such a secondary issue to me. Like I just want to live at this point. I just want to see my kids grow up. And so I had the surgery and it went well and I had to recover for a couple months. Well, the time I had to sit on the couch was during the 2020 election in the fall. And I got so angry about what was happening to our country and our beautiful state of Colorado. And it became so clear to me that um, God wanted me to do bigger things and to to take chances and to take risks and to go big. Mm. And I came out of that. I remember a few months later meeting with some of my friends who had helped me politically they were like, obviously, you're not going to run for anything. This is early 2021. And I'm like, you know what? When they took out that tumor, they took out my filter, and I am feistier than ever. And it's never been more <laughs> clear what I'm supposed to do. That's awesome. And I'm supposed to take on you know, the governorship. And they're like, Heidi, that's nuts. Like, you can't do this. And I was like, I know so clearly that that's what I'm supposed to do. And so, you know, obviously, we went through some polling and figured out if it was yeah. feasible. And, yeah. and um, it was. Incredible. and. And it's, it's, it's a time. We were created for a time as this, and everybody's rising up together. It's mostly moms and parents oh, yeah. who are leading this movement right now and helping me get to where I need to go. And, and you, someone had, shout out to the person who asked the question, what made you want to run for governor? So it's just seeing how crazy things are. and like It's the kids. Yeah, I could, yeah driven by the kids. Yeah, it's, I have four kids. I have twins that are nine, a 12-year-old, and a 26-year-old. And there's mm. three stats that drive me right now. The first one is that we have one of the highest suicide rates in the country for children in Colorado. Mm. And you know what blows me away? It's Summit County. Like this is, people vacation mm-hmm. to go skiing in Summit County. You get there, it's like, this is heaven. Yeah. And that's got one of the highest suicide rates in the country. That's right. It's yeah. crazy. Colorado's terrible for suicide and it's getting worse. And then we have the second highest drug addiction rate for children in mm. the United States. And then the third thing is 60%, 6-0. 60% of our children in Colorado are not reading, writing, or doing math at grade level. Wow. Yeah, wow. our kids are in crisis. I love your focus on this because I was, I was listening to an interview you have with somebody, <laughs> and this person's like, well, why did you delete your stuff from Twitter? Well, <laughs> duh. I mean, if you said something a little off that was acceptable 10 years ago, yeah. that doesn't fit this narrow lane now, you know? Because now we're so open-minded, now that we're like a post-Christian society. Yeah, give me a break. Uh, there's such God, a judgmental, it, it, like, like I can't possibly defend every single word I ever said, right? And the person kept coming back to, well, what do you think about January 6th? And what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And you kept coming back to, what about kids? What do you think about our kids? Yeah, what's right? happening to our kids Yeah, there? like, guys, your house is on fire. Yes. And we're, they're, they're dying, literally dying. 
Yeah. I read I read a couple stats. One in four girls say they seriously contemplated suicide. Mm -hmm. One in four teenage girls, and uh, this one blew me away too. Uh, the teens that said they feel quote persistently hopeless rose from twenty six percent to forty four percent in the past like several years. And I so as a as a guy who's um, in, in direct ministry, my mm -hmm. answers to that are very clean and clear. Right, I'm, I'm I'm bringing people to to a relationship with Jesus. A lot of times they uh, some of it's psychological, right? Uh, but very often some metaphysical problems. Like I, I don't know why I exist. Yes. So I'm falling into a, a sadness. Um, obviously, you're not theocratic. <laughs> you're like, we're going to bring a theocracy in the state of Colorado. Um, but that doesn't mean your faith isn't forming you know, what you're doing. So what are, what are solutions to things like kids wanting to just fall into the abyss um, that, are, that are political? How do you create a, a, a world that encourages hope? Well, you set a good example. You be, yeah. the, be the change you want to see in politics and in leadership and lead with kindness mm. and empathy mm. and be a happy warrior. People so need light right now. It's been such a dark time mm. and we're ready for some hope. And you know what? America is all about hope. Mm -hmm. That's the other reason I'm running. I have been so blessed to live the American dream yeah. and come from nothing and grow a business around something that I love and create thousands of jobs and create opportunity awesome. for people. And I want to make sure that that's protected for our kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. And it's slipping away right before our eyes. Yeah. And if we don't stand up and say something right now, mm -hmm. it will be gone. What are some of the biggest factors you see taking that away from kids today? <laughs> Education. Yeah, our schools. Our schools, they're teaching nonsense in the classrooms. Yeah, yeah. We just talked about the stat that our kids can't read or write or do math. Yeah. They don't have time to learn to read or but, write or do math because yeah. they're learning so much. Yeah, know. no, they're familiar with 60 different gender options yep. in, in the first grade, but they don't, they don't know math. And it's like, well, why are they so confused? Well, these poor kids aren't, you know, like, let, let them flourish, kind of step back. and. Well, and let parents and, take control. Yeah. Parents should be the ones right? teaching these things to their children. And yeah. you know what? Yeah. Bad on Jared Polis and the Democrat. I mean, I'm sorry. We don't want to yeah. get too political. No, no, but I hear you. I hear you. I'm really upset about this idea that parents shouldn't be in charge of our children's education mm. and their learning, their spirituality, the tough conversations oh, around yeah. Yeah. gender and sexuality. Yeah, let, uh, really, let parents have the authority that God right. gave them, and they know their kids the best. That's right. I mean, and it's a, it's a thanks for fighting that battle. That battle gets you a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, like I said, I was, I was uh, amazed that my dogs got along so well in Camp Bow Wow. <laughs> Would that humans got along that well when we're disagreeing about important issues, yeah. right? Uh, I'm sure you've experienced that people can be really mean when you're running for governor or when you're just trying to start a business, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's the importance of joy and holding on to that because otherwise, what are we modeling for this next generation? That's right. How do you hold on to joy uh, when you're getting attacked from left, right, and center? And, and how do you, um, I mean, you got, you got four kids? Yeah. And you're married. Like, how, how do you hold that all intact and still be present? It's got to be incredible. I'm sure you're learning by the day. So <laughs> yes, every day is an adventure. there's got to be incredible like gear shifting from like, here I'm debating with the governor of the state of Colorado. And I'm like, hey, mm -hmm. how's it going, kids? How do you how do you shift the gears? Or are you just still trying to figure this out yourself? Yeah, I think you take one moment at a time, one day at a time, and yeah. you try and do your best. You can't be a good CEO, mom governor candidate all at the same time so mm. you just compartmentalize and mm. like yesterday I just took my 12 year old to the mall and we walked around and got a lemonade and just did normal stuff right yeah. and those moments are so precious to me now and so I am able to just shut everything out and focus on you know the individual child or getting home in time to tuck them into bed and do our little bedtime routine um, praying mm. with them going to it's church beautiful. You know, just it's the sim. I, it's taught me to relish in the simple things again. I think it's. I, I love the, the compartmentalized um, message there too. I mean, we're the same person wherever we are. But I, I think uh, I struggle with this myself. Um, if I'm working too much, but I really just have to, yeah. I feel guilty that I'm failing as a dad. I go home, I feel guilty that I'm failing <laughs> the ministry slash business, and uh, it's like you know what? Let go of the guilt and just be where you are. That's right. Yeah, that's 
we'll, we'll be praying for you because that is no small thing. Thank um, you. Yeah. So to go full circle here, uh, you had said you when when Bayan died, there was a, a obviously a great faith struggle. Mm-hmm. It brought up big fundamental questions. Uh, here you are, and you could look back, you know, hindsight twenty twenty, and see um, there's there's great strength and vision God gave you th- as you walked through that suffering, mm-hmm. even the suffering of the the, the brain tumor. Yeah. Right. Uh, talk about focusing you real fast and hard on what matters and what doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Matter. Um, how did you? How would you articulate how you came back to that that place of faith and that that 2020 hindsight? Because a lot of people experience the suffering mm-hmm. and never come back. Mm-hmm. You know, um, or they uh, or they or they they try an entrepreneurial adventure and fail, and then they stay in that place of darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What 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 eventually brought you around to faith again? Was it was it mainly the the dogs and the people and. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the miracle. It's the miracle of um, healing. It's the miracle mm-hmm. of um, learning to live with your grief. Like it, I tell people, it's like losing a limb. You learn to live with it, but it's mm-hmm. it gets to a point where it's so comforting to know that there's more after mm-hmm. this, and that you're going to see your loved one again, and that um, there's mm-hmm. someone walking this path with you. And mm-hmm. I've felt, I mean, for many years now, I've felt God walking with me, and I just. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid. Mm. And the only thing I was afraid of when I faced the brain tumor and surgery and you know, mortality was leaving my kids um, behind to, to be raised without a mom. That was my only fear. Mm. But I wasn't afraid to, you know, to embrace God and mm. move on but to, and to, to leave my husband. I love my husband to death right yeah. now. And, and yeah. um, just that's the hard part, your parents, the people that you would leave behind. Mm. Because you not because I know how much they would uh, there would be a hole without that sounds yeah. silly but no totally oh, it doesn't sound silly at all obviously it'd be a massive hole it's, yeah uh, wow I, I just love that the um, that's the message of Good Friday yes you know I just I I love you enough to have done this with you walk the path of death with you and I'm just here with you I'm just here and and just to, just to hear that you just felt that presence. And not a real big answer of like, here's, here's why in my grand scheme of things. No, there's no, I wish there was a big answer, yeah. but, but it's subtle. It's in the, the rainbows you see or the birds that you, you know, mm. land on your, your deck when you're sitting there. You just feel this presence and mm. you feel this sense of calm and joy and contentment, contentment and, and um, you know, the, the people that have been brought into my life and the journey I've been on, um, it's just been, you know, I look back and think, wow, um, Brian, yeah. Brian gave me such a gift through his death, and like Jesus gave us. Yes. Oh, it's beautiful. In teaching, I mean, and Brian's favorite saying was carpe diem, seize the day. Yeah. And I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And Heidi, if I could just honor the, uh, I know, just the beauty of, of your path. Um, and because I, I, I think that God wants to highlight that for people, honestly. Like when someone's running for a political office, whether you win or not, it's it's um it's a, a time of intense messaging, mm-hmm. and who who you are and what you embody sends an important message uh, to the people you're campaigning for, right? It's kind of like if I'm on a, on a preaching circuit, yeah. Like that's that's what you're kind of doing in in a, in a really big sense. But part of the message of your life that is really inspiring to me is that um, you you lean into the presence of God and you decided to turn the grief outward and do cool things <laughs> <laughs> to make the world a better place. Uh, from from Camp Bow Wow to to fighting back, um, to, to all the different things you're doing, it's about serving other people, which is is the ultimate path out of the misery. Yeah, you know, and, it, and that's counterintuitive today. A lot of people are, we're in it for ourselves, right? And people are in politics for themselves, and it's like, no, that's not the path to happiness. <clears throat> so thanks for embodying that path to joy. Thanks, Chris. I, I, I honor honor that, and we'll certainly be praying for you. We got like a minute or so left. I'd love you just to. Look into the camera, and if someone's in that dark moment you were in, and there are people, there's a lot of people watching, and there's people who just lost a loved one. There's people who just lost a career or experienced some tragedy mm-hmm. and who don't see how that ties in mm-hmm. to the big picture and to the love of God for them. So what would you say to that person who's watching right now? Oh, I'd, <clears throat> I'd say find comfort in knowing that um, God is there for you, and your faith is what will 
be your comfort and your presence along this path. And it's not going to be easy. Every day is either hard or um, painful in some ways, but find the joy in the small things and find the joy in the relationships you have and the the comforts of, uh, I don't know, a good meal or being with a friend and taking a walk or seeing the sunset or the butterfly and find joy in the small things and pretty soon they'll add up and there will be more joy in the day than grief. Um, and you'll have comfortable, good, happy memories taking over most of the space rather than, you know, sadness and, and overwhelm. So hang in there. Hi, thanks for being a model of living joy. Of course. We, we, we're praying for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so honored by your time today. I know you're absurdly busy. Thanks for sharing this moment with us. Thanks, Chris. And thank you guys for sharing the moment with us. Love you guys. Happy and blessed Holy Week to you. Mm -hmm.